بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الغر الميامين My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أعطيناك الكوثر فصل لربك وانحر إن شانئك هو الأبتر This is called Surah Al-Kawthar One of the short chapters in the Quran And I believe most of you may memorize this chapter Because it is formed of three verses only And I would like to talk about this chapter. But before that, I want to take you to a historic background for this verse. I want to take you to the historic incident in which this chapter was revealed to the Prophet. So historians say that the Prophet, our Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was in Mecca. And he was coming back from the burial of his second son. The Prophet had two sons, Al Qasim and Abdullah, and they both died while infant. So, in his way back home, after burying his second son, Abdullah, he passed by a group of infidels, those people who vowed to fight him and fight his message. Among them was a man named Al-As, Al-As ibn Wa'il. And they were discussing the Prophet and ways with which they can confront him and undermine him. So as the Prophet was passing by them, Al-As <coughs> looks at, at his colleagues and he tells them, don't worry. You don't need to plan a lot to counter Muhammad. Muhammad soon will die. And when he dies, he has no heir son who will carry his name after his death. And therefore, with his death, his message will die as well. So he calls the prophet Aptar. Aptar in Arabic, is a man with no posterity, no kids, no sons, in fact. Because Arabs believed that only a son can carry his father's name. A daughter is not entitled for that. Only a son, a male member of the family can carry the legacy of the father. And not only that, they considered their true children are the male ones, the boys. The girls are sub, sub children. Because in their eyes, women were subhumans after all. They were not fully humans. And they always degraded women. And they always belittled women. And they always looked at women with so much disgrace. So if you want to use a contemporary terminology, you can say they were uh, misog misogynist, misogynist, just like our president. <laughs> so that's what happened when this ayah, this verse was revealed to the prophet. Now, Allah is comforting the prophet. Allah is telling him that, yes, my beloved prophet, 
you lost your two sons, but don't worry, we will give you the kawthar. The kawthar in Arabic means the abundance. We will give you the abundance. Fatima is the abundance, meaning, yes, we took your two sons, but we are giving you something more important and more significant than your son. We're giving you Fatima, through which your offspring will continue, through which your lineage lineage will continue in the community through which she will carry your legacy among Muslims. And that was a watershed in the Islamic history where Islam elevated women's status by Allah calling Fatima the Kawthar. As I mentioned earlier, Arab men always look down upon women. They did not treat them well. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another surah, surah al-Na'al, the bees, Allah offers a very grim, a very grim picture of the situation, women's situation and its status in the Arabian Peninsula. Allah says in surah al-Na'al, the bees, ayah 58, this is what he says. He says, وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى ضَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ When one of them is told about having a female uh, baby, his face turns dark. Why? Because of the bad news he is receiving. وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى ضَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا he disappears. He disappears from his colleagues and his peers due to the grave news he received. He would contemplate, should he, he keep her alive or he would rather kill her and bury her alive? Should he keep her with disgrace, having the stigma, or he should just get rid of her and kill her? What a, the Quran says, what a terrible judgment they used to make by deciding to kill they're infant babies simply because she was a girl. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another ayah, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ In the day of judgment, Allah will ask that baby why she was killed. What was the reason she was killed? What did she do? What, did, what, what kind of a crime she committed that she deserved to be killed while infant. So that was the situation in the Arabian Peninsula. Women were a stigma. Having a girl was a big stigma that Arab men tried to avoid by any price, with any price. And women had no right in that community at all. In fact, a man would not at all show affection and love to his daughters. That was a big aid. That was a big aib. Not only that, he would take pride in killing his daughter. One day, the Prophet ﷺ was talking and remembering the time before Islam when this barbaric act was rampant in the Arabian Peninsula. Widespread practice among Arabs before Islam when one of his companions tells Ya Rasulullah, I have a story, but I don't know if you can handle. The Prophet says, go ahead. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I had 10, 10 girls. God gave me 10 girls and I buried them all alive. But then one day I traveled and my wife was pregnant. And when I came back home, I asked my wife about the about her pregnancy, and she told me she miscarried. But then, 
Once in a while, I see a beautiful girl, two years old, three years old, coming to our house, filling our house with joy and love. And I ask my wife, who is she? She says to me, this is neighbors, your neighbor's daughter. And I look at her with so much adoration and love. And one day when she noticed in me my longing for having a baby girl like her, she says to me, do you love her? I said, yes, of course I do. She looks so nice, so pretty, so cute. I wish I had one like her. My wife naively told me, she's your daughter. I kept her away because I was afraid you will kill her. I said, no, I would kill her. I love her. But then when she was four or five years old and she was with me in the house, one day I took her with me out. I took her all the way to the desert. And the shaitan was playing with my mind. And when I got to the desert, there is nobody around. I started digging a hole in the desert. And my child, my beautiful girl, looking at me, the dust was falling my, on my head and on my shoulder. She was busy removing the dust from my hair and from my shoulder. And as I was digging, I finished digging the hole. I grabbed her with my full force and I threw her into the grave. And she started crying and begging and begging, Dad, I love you. Don't bury me. Please, don't bury me. And I kept on throwing sand on her. She told me, the f last word she told me, Dad, if you don't want me, give me away to some other families. But I refused. I continued. I continued throwing sand on her till her voice disappeared. <clears throat> the prophet is listening and his tears are flowing on his cheek. Our prophet, our prophet is the prophet of mercy, prophet of rahmah. Allah described him with one word, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ I have sent you to be rahmah, mercy, not for Muslims, not for Arabs, for the entire mankind, للعالمين. Our Holy Prophet was listening when his, and his cheek, has his tears were flowing on his cheek. And he turns to the man and he says to him, please leave, leave this place. I don't want you to sit here. I'm afraid God will level you with a big thunder and he will kill you and we might be hurt because of you. Go and leave. You're a man with no rahmah, no mercy in your heart. I don't want to hear this story from you anymore. The man told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, I'm regretful for what I have done. And I have done this when I was not Muslim, when I was not mu'min, when I did not believe in God. That happened when I was extremely ignorant. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds Muslims and particularly Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula. Remember when you were, when you hated each other, you killed each other. Because of Islam, because of the mercy of the Prophet, you became brothers. You became sisters, you would love one another. Now, if you give a Muslim individual $1 million, $2 million, if you give him the entire world, not to kill his child, but to harm, harm his child, will not do that. So, back to the subject, my dear brothers and sisters. Those Arabs before Islam, they always degraded women. They always belittled them. They gave them no right whatsoever. No emotion, no affection. All of a sudden, the Prophet 
appearing among them and see how he would treat his daughter Fatima. Fatima was so loved by her father that the Prophet does not shy away from expressing his feelings toward his daughter in that very rigid society. When she comes to visit him, the Prophet stands up out of respect. He would kiss her, he would place a kiss on her cheek, on, on her forehead, and he would have her sit in his spot, in his seat. He shows her so much love, so much respect. Not one day passes without the Prophet going to her house, checking on her, checking on her children. The Prophet is passing by in the street when he happens to be pa passing by Fatima's house and he hears her child Hussein crying. He asks his entourage, the Muslims, to wait for him for a few minutes so he can go inside and check on his grandson Hussein. He goes inside and he says to Fatima, Fatima, why Hussein is crying? Don't you know that when I hear him crying, that breaks my heart? Don't ever allow Hussein cry. Do whatever to please him. Do whatever to quiet him. Don't let Hussein. He is so beloved to my heart. And every day the Prophet makes sure he stops at Fatima's house. When he goes to Fatima's house, he stands at the door. He asks for permission, the Prophet himself. He asks for permission to enter his house, his daughter's house. He does not just enter. He's trying to show Muslims how sacred this house, how sacred his daughter, how great she is, that even her father would ask for a permission before entering the house. He recites this verse, verse number 33 in chapter 33. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Surely Allah has decided to remove all iniquities and impurities from you, the family of the Prophet. And then he says, Ya ala bayt Rasulullah, O oh, you, the family of the Prophet, the daughter of the Prophet, ata'adhanuna li Rasulullah bid-dukhul? Would you permit the messenger of Allah to enter your house? And he hears his daughter Fatima alayhi salam from inside the house telling him Abatah, Al Baytu Baytuk, it is your house, you don't need the permission. Wal Hurratu Bnatuk and the household is your daughter. I'm honored to have you. And one day the Quran revealed a verse in which instructing Muslims to never call the Prophet by his name. By the way, my dear brothers and sisters, if you go to the Quran and flip through the pages of the Quran, you see Allah addressing his prophets, all the prophets, by their naked, by their naked names. Ya Adam, Ya Ibrahim, Ya Yahya, Ya Musa, Ya Isa. Every single prophet in the Quran is mentioned by his naked name. When Allah addresses him, addresses him by his naked name, except for our Holy Prophet. He would never addresses him by his naked name. There is no verse in the Quran in which Allah says to the Prophet, Ya Muhammad, if he were to talk to address the Prophet, what would he say? Ya Ayyuhal Rasul, or you the messenger, or Ya Ayyuhal Nabi, or you the Prophet of Allah. Never ever, Allah, Allah, out of respect, would never call the Prophet by his naked name. But those Badawian Arabs, very uncivilized men, would come and talk to the Prophet as he is one of them. When they talk to him, they show disrespect to the Prophet. They call him, Ya Muhammad, Ya Muhammad. What do you mean, Ya Muhammad? Call him 
Ya Rasulullah, Ya Nabi Allah, don't call him by his name. One time a group of them came to visit the Prophet and the Prophet had just left the masjid. He went home to sleep, to rest a little bit. It was during summertime and the heat was soaring. What did they do? Instead of waiting for the Prophet in the masjid, they wait. They went chasing him to his house. They stood at the door calling him, Ya Muhammad, Akhruj ilayna. Oh Muhammad, come out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals in Surah Al-Hujurat, Inna al-ladheena yunadunaka min wara'i al-hujurati akhtharuhum la ya'lamu. Those who are calling you out from behind the door, they are a bunch of ignorant. And they were a bunch of ignorant. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Muslims to address the Prophet with his title, Ya Rasulullah. Every time you want to address him, he's the messenger of God. He's the most honorable man. لا تجعلوا دعاء النبي كدعاء بعضكم بعضا أن تحبط أعمالكم وأنتم لا تعلمون. Do not call the Prophet the way you call each other. For Allah may let all your good deeds go in vain if you do that. So everybody started calling the Prophet what? Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet comes to Fatima's house and Fatima calls him Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet looks at Fatima and he says, Fatima, this is not for you. I want you to call me dad. I want you to call me my father. This verse was not meant for you. This was meant for those uncivilized Arabs who disrespect your father. Not for you. I don't want you to call me Ya Rasulullah. I want you to call me my dad. Ya Abata, you are my only daughter. And I would love to hear that from you calling, you, calling me dad. Don't call me Ya Rasulullah. I know you want to be respectful with your dad, but that's not for you. I would love to hear you calling me your dad because you are my only beloved daughter. And the Prophet Wasallam keeps Fatima so dear to him. That every time someone proposes to her to marry her, the Prophet declines. He says, listen, the issue with her marriage is not in my hand. It is in God's hand. Abu Bakr proposes and he gets rejected. Omar proposes and he gets rejected. A wealthy man called Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he proposes. And he tells the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, I can offer any dowry you want. The Prophet says what is basically meant to get off my way. I don't want to see you. I don't want to hear this rubbish talk from you. You're trying to lure me with your money? Who do you think you are? Don't mention that. The Prophet rejects them one after another. And he declares that the decision on her marriage is not in my hand, it is in God's hand. Till Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, approaches. And the Imam was only 21 year old when he approached. And Fatima was 14, 15 year old. And when he approached the Prophet, <clears throat> immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel down telling the Prophet, instructing Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, inna al-aliyya al-a'la yaqra'uka as-salam wa yaqool zawwij al-nura min al-nur. Jibreel tells the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, God sent his salams to you. And he says, many of the light to the light. And Rasulullah says, what light? To what light? Qala zawwij Fatima ta min Ali. Mary Fatima. To Ali ibn Abi Talib, that is the proper husband for her. And the Prophet immediately accepts the proposal. 
marriage proposal extended by Ali ibn Abi Talib. And now it was time for Imam Ali to offer the dowry. And listen to this. Some people believe that the dowry, even in our community nowadays, they believe that the dowry is a price tag for the girl. The dowry is not a price tag. So if you are a wealthy person, doesn't mean you have to ask for a higher rate as the tradition sometimes goes in our community. So it's not a price tag. Your daughter cannot be measured. Her value cannot be measured with cash. Your daughter is much more valuable than any cash. So that's not a price tag. What the dowry is in Islam, it's a token of appreciation given by the husband to his wife to show his love and his appreciation and that she is loved. When you go somewhere to your friend's house, to your relative's house and you love them, you take a gift with you. The gift doesn't have to be very expensive, my dear brothers and sisters. It doesn't mean it has to be very valuable. You take a, val a bouquet of flower, $50, $100, not a big deal. But that bouquet of flower shows your love and your respect to your neighbor or to your relative or to your friend. So the Imam asked the Prophet, what kind of dowry I'm supposed to offer? The Prophet says, what can you offer? What do you have, Ya Ali? Imam Ali says, I own three things only. Only three things. I own a sword with which I fight in the battle for Islam. I own a shield with which I protect myself in the battlefield when I find, when I fight. And I own a camel. I own a camel that occasionally I use it for work. The Imam Ali used to work, used to work himself. And working is an honor, my dear brothers and sisters. Imam Ali used to work with his own hand. The Prophet tells Imam Ali, you need your, your camel for your work. That's the source of income for you. As for your sword, we need your sword. Islam needs your sword. Without Imam Ali's sword, Islam could not have risen to where it got. It was Imam Ali's sword that secured a glory for Islam. It was Imam Ali's sacrifices at the battlefield that made Islam so strong. Number one soldier in the army of the Prophet. Every time the Prophet goes to a battle, Imam Ali would be on his side. Never once he missed any battle. Never once he missed fighting for the sake of Allah next to the Prophet. He says, as for your sword, we need your sword. But you don't need a shield because you're a lion. A lion doesn't need a shield. You can get rid of your shield. Imam Ali goes and he sells his shield and he brings the money back to the Prophet. It was 500 dirhams. In today's currency, in today's value, it's worth $750 in today's value. The 500 dirhams, it's valued at $750. Dollars because because each dirham is four grams four grams of silver. So if you have five hundred, that's two thousand grams of silver. You can Google the price of silver today. That would be around seven to eight hundred dollars. Not not nothing more than that. He brings the money to the prophet, and with that money the prophet assigns the three companions, Bilal, Abu Bakr, and Abu Dhar, to go and buy some furniture for Fatima's house. Very simple. 
very simple, very humble, their bedroom was not furnished with any Persian rug, with any rug at all. It was furnished with sand. There is nothing special in Fatima's furniture. There is nothing special about her house, no fancy house, no fancy furniture, and she is the daughter of the Prophet. And remember, my dear brothers and sisters, that our Holy Prophet was not only a prophet, he was the head of state. He was ruling a country as vast as the Arabian Peninsula. In today's geography, it includes eight countries. Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Oman, and Yemen. Eight countries the Prophet used to rule. He was a head of state. He wasn't a man who didn't have money if he wanted to enrich himself and his family. If the Prophet wanted to buy the best furniture for his daughter, he could. But he didn't want to. One day the Prophet was coming back from a trip. And by the way, every time the Prophet comes back from a trip, the first house he would visit is the house of his daughter Fatima. Before going to his own house, before checking on his wife, he would go and check on Fatima. So, and Fatima's house would be the last house the Prophet would visit before leaving the town. So one time the Prophet came in and he noticed there was a new curtain, a new curtain on the wall that Fatima was hanging. And he looked, and he looked that he also noticed that Hassan and Hussein, who were three and four year old each, they were wearing a necklace with a small piece of ivory on it. And the Prophet didn't stay much. He just said salam and he left immediately. And Fatima realized that there's something wrong that the Prophet didn't like. She, she realized the reason that the Prophet didn't stay long this time because he saw that brand new uh, curtain on the wall. She took it down and she took the two necklaces from her two sons next. And she called on Bilal and she says, Ya Bilal, go to my father and tell him to give this to the poor for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By the time Bilal comes to the masjid, the Prophet was already sitting on the pulpit speaking to Muslims. And when the Prophet sees Bilal coming, approaching him with that curtain and with the two necklaces, he smiles and he says, Fa'alat fidaha abuha. Fa'alat fidaha abuha. Fa'alat fidaha abuha. I love my daughter Fatima. I am willing to protect her. I am willing to protect her life by dying for her. Three times repeating that. And then the Prophet explains, Wa ma li ali Muhammadin wa dunya. People can enjoy this mundane world. People, ordinary people, ordinary citizens, ordinary Muslims can enjoy worldly gains, but not my family. My family is not allowed to be tainted with the worldly gains because I want them to be up high with me in paradise. I don't want them to be tainted. This is the worldly gains to the Prophet. What you and I consider to be a gift, a grant, a prize, a treasure, is nothing but a filth to the Prophet. Trust me. It nothing, it's nothing but a filth to the Prophet and his family. One day, Imam Ali was approached by a poor person. And the man asked the Imam to give him something. The Imam looks at his secretary, his name is Qambar. And he says, Qambar, give this guy a hundred. A hundred. The man says, a hundred what? Just like me saying, give him a hundred. A hundred what? A hundred dollars or a hundred cents? 
A hundred cents is one dollar. But a hundred dollars is a hundred dollars. So the Imam did not specify what unit. A hundred what? A hundred dinars or dirhams? Because each dinar equals 14 dirhams. So the secretary asked the Imam, what should I give him? A hundred dinars or dirhams? The Imam says, don't ask me. Ask him what he likes. Ask him if he wants dirham or dinar. For me, dirham and dinar and the sand, they are all the same. To me, they don't mean nothing. Ask him what he likes. That's how the Prophet looked at this dunya. That's how Fatima al-Zahra looked at this dunya. That's why she was not so attached to this dunya, my dear brothers and sisters. One thing differentiates between us and Ahlul Bayt is our attachment to this world. Imagine, God forbid, what would happen to you if you are told you just lost $200,000? I bet you many of us would get heart attack, stroke. Trust me, I'm not joking. Some of us may go to the emergency room. I remember, I remember one time I was visiting someone and someone called him while I was there and they told him you lost $100,000 in the stock, uh, stock market. And immediately his blood pressure went up and the guy was about to die. And I told him, listen, your life is more precious than $100,000. I know it's a loss, but your life is more precious. But to trust me, for Ahl al-Bayt, $100,000 or a million dollars or one dollar are the same. We don't care at all. And the next, she was wearing something terrible. One out. And Fatima goes and she brings her wedding dress. And she gives it to her. And a few minutes later, the Prophet comes in. And he inquires about the wedding dress. Where is it? She says, Ya Rasulullah, a lady just came. And she asked me for a dress. And I gave her that. Rasulullah says, did you give her your wedding dress? She says, yes, Ya Rasulullah. Not that the Prophet was a stingy. He wanted to test his daughter. He says, how come you didn't give her another one instead of the wedding dress? Listen to what Fatima al-Zahra says. Let's learn from Fatima al-Zahra. She says, Ya Rasulullah, I read the Quran. So you and I also read the Quran, but we don't get the conclusion Fatima al-Zahra gets. We just read and we pass by the Quran without reflection. Fatima al-Zahra reads and reflects and applies. She says, Ya Rasulullah, I read the Quran and I run by this ayah. Allah says, Lan tanalul birr hatta tunfiqu mimma tuhibboon. You shall not achieve the highest level of righteousness until you spend of which you like. Listen to this. I repeat. You Muslims shall not attain the highest level of righteousness until you spend of which you like. What do we do usually? Anything rubbish I have at home, I will take it to the masjid. I would take it to the Zaman. I would take it to the uh, Salvation Army. And then I consider that a charity. That's not a charity. Because I want to get rid of these things. Anything worn out, anything old, I want to get rid of it. I say, you know what? I brought you this. Well, if you're serious, why don't you take what you like? Not what you dislike. We usually, we usually donate what we like, we dislike. Anything that is a burden on us, we want to get rid of it, we give it to others. But Fatima al-Zahra says, no, that dress is my most loved dress. And when I read the Quran and I put the dots together, I realized in order for me to achieve the highest level of piety and righteousness, 
I would donate my best clothes, not my old one. Yes, I was able to give away my old one, but no. I gave my new one because that what the Quran instructs me. You want to give to the poor? Don't give your trash away. Don't give things that you don't need or they are nothing but a burden in your closet. Rather take what's good and what is nice and what is loved and what is desired. Don't take your citizen watch and give it away. That has no battery and it's about to stop working. Give your Rolex watch. Give, give what you like. Don't give things that are really with no significance. That was Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. My dear brothers and sisters, we will allow a few minutes for questions and answers. So if you have any question, please go ahead and speak up so I can hear you. And uh, with this way, inshallah, I will be able to answer some of the questions. There was a young brother who said he had a question. Was that you, Ammu? Was that you? You said you have a question? Okay, stand up. Okay. Is there a reason why, why, is it, why does like, Allah take people? Is there like, a reason for that? Why there is a reason why Allah take people? You mean make them die? Yeah. Okay, yes, there is a reason. I tell you what reason. If God doesn't make us die, we will ask him to take us and make us die. Because the world will be overpopulated. And there is no room for everybody. And there is no food for everybody. And those who would age will come nothing but a burden on other people. Right? So, in, in fact, death is rahmah by itself. Death is rahmah. There is a narration tells us that one of the prophets of Israelite asked God to stop death and God answered him. 20, 30 years later, people came begging him to restore death because people were aging, they were becoming a burden. So, for example, my grandfather becomes a burden on me my father also becomes a burden on me. And assuming there is no death, my grand-grandfather becomes elderly and becomes a burden on me. No. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're never a burden. They're never a burden. <laughs> but the incident in Livonia tells otherwise. <laughs> so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his mercy, decided to take us while we are still maintaining our dignity and make people cry for us. Imagine if I become 150 years old with cane, I cannot, with no mobility, I cannot hear, I become burden on my kids and my grandkids, right? That, that may, they may wish I would die. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before letting that to happen, He will take us. When you're so young, you go to heaven. Because God wants to send him to heaven. Any other question? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah ahlan jami. Yes. Did they convert to Islam? Yes. What happened to them? And did the Nabi used to fight in the war? Yes. Very good question. Jamil is asking why the war? Why the fighting? The Prophet, why he would fight? Christians, some extremist Christians, tell us Muslims that Jesus never fought. He didn't have to kill anybody. But your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, had to fight. Let me answer that. 
Those who say this, they forget that Jesus, with all due respect to him, he was a private citizen. He was a private citizen. He never assumed any public responsibility. He never had a state. He never had the responsibility of managing the affairs, the civil affairs of a community. Yes, he was a spiritual guy, but he was not a head of state. But when Prophet Muhammad founded a new nation, Jesus did not find a new nation. Jesus came to preach to the Israelites. While Prophet Muhammad came to found a new nation. Now, when he founded a new nation, he founded also a new judiciary system, a new culture, a new mindset that provoked his enemies and adversaries to fight him, to fight back. He had to stand his ground. He had to defend his society. So the prophet was not only a prophet, but he was also a head of state. He had to defend his community, his society. The prophet in 10 years endured 83 battles and wars, 83. All of them, with no exception, were imposed on him. They were all defensive wars for the Prophet. He had to defend himself. In some cases, they were preemptive wars, meaning before the enemy gets to him, he would strike first. Knowing that the enemy is coming to him, he would strike first. But all those wars were defensive. Meaning his enemies would not leave him alone. If they left him alone, he would not go for a war. In fact, his logo was no war till I preach to them. No war till I preach to my enemies. Meaning before I fight with them, I explain what Islam is. I invite them to Islam. I try to educate them, educate my adversaries. If they accept, God bless them. If not, and they insist on fighting, then I have to fight. So that was his policy all along, that he is not interested in any, in any uh, blood, bloodshed. But sometimes he had to. He had to, just like we Americans, in order to gain our independence, we had to go through the war, independence war. Just like the French people, in order to gain their dignity, they had to revolt and offer sacrifices. Thousands of people were killed. Algeria, Algeria, in order to be freed from the French occupation, do you know what is called Algeria in Arabic? The country of one million martyrs. One million martyrs. One million people were killed in Algeria when the population did not exceed 10 million. Meaning 10% of the nation was wiped out because the nation was seeking independence and dignity. So the Prophet had to defend himself. He had to defend his country, had to defend the new religion. He could not sit and say, you know what, come and wipe us all out. He couldn't say that. He couldn't do that. Had he done that, you guys were not Muslim today. So the Prophet had to defend Islam. The second question, did he fight? Yes, he did fight. He fought, he fought bravely. He was the first to fight. And he would inspire, he would inspire his, his soldiers by his fighting. Never, never ever the Prophet back down from any, any battle or war. Never he ran away. Always he stood the ground. Always. In the darkest moment, in the battle of Uhud, he was surrounded by enemy from all directions. They surrounded him by hundreds, by hundreds. He had only five people defending him. He never ran away. He stood his ground and he fought till he uh, till the end of the war. Any other question? Or I should conclude? 
Thank you so much, my dear brothers and sisters. Let's conclude with the dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma aghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat tabi' allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat innaka mujib al-da'awat innaka qadhi al-hajat innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir wa ila arwah al-mu'minina wal mu'minat naqra' al-surat al-mubarakat al-fatiha